And we are live. We are live. <laughs> How is everyone doing? Um, uh, I'm awesome. I've had yeah. several sips I'm of my drink. I'm great. <laughs> what I is just went and drink? got. I just went and got some nice box wine. Nice. Is it Chardonnay or? Uh, it's a. I think it's a Viognier. I'm not really sure what that is, but I like it. Okay. <laughs> um, so it's whatever the box wine sale was this week at my local. Uh, <laughs> that sounds good. I like box so, wine. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have my lovely sherry. Is that the sherry, sherry, Ellen, the Pedro Jimenez? Yes. Yes, it is. Oh, that's great stuff. It's okay, amazing. yeah, people are starting to comment it now. Tastes like raisins. Yeah, that stuff it's is like amazing. Raisins. Yeah, I have uh, three like, philosophers from Omegang. I'll, I'll get it's the good. bottle. Hold on. Sorry, what is that, Matt? It's uh, three philosophers from Omegang. It's mm -hmm. um, they're a brewery out of I think Cooperstown, New York. Mm -hmm. You brought that um, to one of our meetings once or something, didn't you? I think I brought, I brought beer to the meeting. I probably yes, did. brought beer to the meeting. I think it was years ago, but I remember seeing that. So it pro I probably did. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. It's it's good stuff. It's good stuff. I uh, I was going to open this is one of our writing group like, meeting. Sorry, we have really good writing group meetings. Oh, that looks good. All right. Oh, that stuff's amazing. You have to get the right exact right one though, because they have other types. But this is the one that tastes um, the the. Hare, I don't even know how to pronounce it. Anyways, Lustau is the brand. Mm -hmm. It's really good. It tastes like raisins. It tastes like raisins. Hey, you Hello, Hello, Hi, <laughs> Hi, Misty. Hi, uh, Hi, Misty. I would love to try that uh, stuff that tastes like raisins, Ellen. I, I have, I'll I get red wine, but what do you say? I'll throw it through the screen. Ah. Yeah. Got I'll, it. I'll, I'll email you. Remind me, and I'll email you the name of it and everything. Unless you just want to take a picture of it or something. Uh, no, I, I'll, I'll try. I mean, I can just watch the stream again. <laughs> so right, that's um, true. Yeah, but uh, I might, I might be able to drink it. Sometimes I have bad reactions to red wine. I get headaches, but okay. I guess we'll find out. The only way to find, like, I can, well, I, I can sometimes drink port wine. It, but obviously, we can't do that for a while. So. <laughs> Sometimes I can drink port wine though. So, and sherry might be, uh, you know, I don't know if it's the same. Similar. It's a very sweet yeah. sherry. Yeah. I don't know if it's the same kind of. Grape? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And Ken, you have sangria, you said? I have homemade sangria. Ooh. Homemade. All right. Ooh, nice. That looks delicious, actually. That's great. <laughs> I practiced it. I, I've never made sangria myself before. I knew I wanted it tonight because it was going to be hot. So I practiced last week. <laughs> Ah, and I had some ingredients because you remember the, at the Nebulas they had uh, they had this bartender, and that you could be instructed on how to make a drink live online. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't actually do that, but they recommended that you have simple syrup, so I made some, mm -hmm. and so I had some, mm -hmm. and so. Is that what you told your family? I'm practicing my reading. <laughs> that is exactly what I told them. Right. Good. <laughs> Hello, people. Hello, Dream Master. Hello, Zigzag. Hello. Hello, <laughs> Melinda. Hi, Clarence. Is that a cat I just heard? Oh, you know, my neighbors, they, they, they're having a, I guess, a party in the backyard, and there's kids there, so they are oh. screaming. I might close oh. the door if it gets loud. Mm -hmm. It's nice to hear the sound of people right enjoying now. themselves as long as they are socially distantly doing so. Yes. Yeah, they are. Yeah. I mean, it's just a family, I think. A couple of friends um, who want to go to have dinner outside in a restaurant. It's like, but we can't stay yeah, more than a foot away from each other, yeah. even outside. Mm -hmm. you know, like, yeah. So it's mm -hmm. like, what? And you have to take, pick up your mask if you're eating you know, in a restaurant. Now it's all going to picnic. We could do that. I totally well, we're not at the I might opening go. anyway. Most of the restaurants in the city uh, aren't going to be doing table service for a long time. No, that's, no, yeah. they're having it outdoor if you have it outdoor services. Mm -hmm. Monday, a lot Although of barber just emailed me, and there he's opening uh, up it with phase two, I think. Oh wow! Okay. So, well, I don't know if I would go to a hair cutter. Can you can you tell? I haven't been to the barber in a while. Well, my hair is finally. This is fine. My hair cutter is cut my bangs so short that it was that they're still too short. Yeah. And, and I'm so pissed off at him. I don't want to go back. So. You didn't decide <laughs> to do a, a selfie barber thing like a lot of people are doing. Uh, I only the only thing I can do is this. I mean, the front part. It's if it goes below my nose, it needs to trim. <laughs> the rest of it, I can't figure out. 
No. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. It would be a mess. It would be really bad. You know? Well, conveniently, I don't have any trouble right now. But <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> I could probably use a little redo up in here. But, you know, it's fine. All right. So uh, we have 18 people watching live at the moment. Hello. Okay. We're a little early, obviously, but we'd like to start a little bit early just to, uh, you I'm know. I'm going to tweet it. Hang on a bit. Welcome everybody in. Yeah, please do. That's great. Where can I find? Hello, Joseph. Let's see what we got here. Da, 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 da. Hi, Allie. So Ken, how are you? How's your teaching going? Because I know you're. Well, well, I'm finally done. You yeah. Know, but now we're starting up for the, for the, for the fall. We were, um, we were going to make a tra a big transition anyway, because we were, um, uh, we used to be on trimester system, and now we're moving to semesters, and that means revising every single course. Uh, that we uh, uh, that we have, so that was already on our plate. But now yeah. we have on our plate that we also have to convert these courses to pass to partial online delivery. And we've been told for sure that mm. after Thanksgiving, everybody's staying home. Mm. So all the final exams are going to be online. All the last three weeks' course is going to be online. So we have to prep, prep for that. So haven't done pretty much anything on that yet. Is that in anticipation of the second wave hitting in winter time? Um, I think it's more along the line of if you have everybody go home for the weekend mm -hmm. and then come to all different parts of the country and then come back to the well, same place. You know, that makes perfect sense. Trouble. Yeah, that makes yeah. perfect sense. Yikes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I, they haven't told me that, but that's that's the way it's at, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. I just announced it on Twitter again. I told people to come by. Yeah, I just did too. Well, that's the great thing, right? Because uh, at the KGB bar, if you like accidentally forgot and went home, you're like, oh, shit. But if you're home, you're just like, oh, I can just go watch it right now. So, right. <laughs> exactly. We're up to 30, 30 viewers now. Melinda's going for a drink. Okay. Make, make a drink. Okay. Get one for us, please. Yeah. yeah. Melinda, Whether go make some get water or cheap box wine or something really fancy. Right. You, you need to hydrate at least. So yeah, go no. get water, even if you don't drink. a little cocktail glass there. <laughs> it's summertime. Hydrate. Yeah. Oh. What was that? Okay. Oh, no. You're right. No, there. there's, a, there's gas in the bottle. When I oh. Two point oh, okay. <laughs> I got to be careful. I don't want to finish this whole thing myself. <laughs> maybe I do. Well, that'll be a completely different kind of entertaining stream, man. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's after the reading, you know. That's, yeah. I figure I'm going to drink, you know, like the first half of my drink now, and then I'm going to drink the rest of it all at once during Nora's reading. Okay, <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, get here we go. Reading starts in a bit, but we're live now. All right, retweeting. My, I don't know who, whose Twitter account, Misty, who's are you talking about? Uh, mine's Ellen Datlow, easy to find. Mine's N.K. Jemison, all one word. Temple Connolly says it's 9 a.m. here and I can't have anything stronger than a coffee yet. <laughs> where are you, Temple Connolly? Where are you, Temple? Let's see, where were you going? 9 a.m. It's like 9 a.m. around the world. I don't know. Maybe Australia, yeah, that's too far to be. No, it's not. It's, seven, it's, it's 14 about, hours ahead. Australia would be about, um, maybe it is Australia. It, it might be. Yeah, Australia. It's, it, Europe's it's usually like six or seven Australia. hours. That sounds like Australia because it's about 14 hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I met it's Australia. Hi, Temple. Okay. Australia. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dirty well, by the way, uh, for, those, today. for those listening, uh, there is a, a little bit of a delay between uh, us speaking and the um, what you see. It's just the way the, the software we're using for streaming. So if we don't respond to you instantly, that's why. Yeah. Uh, one of your former students is talking to you. Did you see that? Oh yeah. Adding to uh, you. So far, so far, three of my students actually. All right. Cool. Tony, Michael, Allie, 
and there may be more that I didn't, that, that I didn't see. <laughs> oh, there's a typo there. Let me fix that. Four, former students. Former students. These, uh, they all graduated. Mm -hmm. Students, either students in my uh, science fiction class or students in my Shakespeare class. Oh, cool. I sat in on one of your law classes. You you lectured one of my law classes. What, no, you. No, no, I didn't you, lecture your law class. You lectured my science fiction class, and yeah. you sat in on the law class. That's I, right. I wouldn't have anything to say to your law class, and my father <laughs> was an attorney. I, I, um, no, your your law class was very interesting, actually. I mean, Matt, uh, you could tell lawyers that they need better websites. I mean, because because that's or, yeah. or better yeah. online security. So. They absolutely do. My my father's uh, firm had the worst website forever, uh, mm. and then I finally re uh, did it for them, and then uh, mm. it was better. And then um, web stuff evolved so quickly. Like you know, you're at Web 2.0, and they're like, "What? What are you talking about? We're at Web 7.0 now." Where are you, <laughs> you know, you yeah, didn't know about this. Is this Widget McGoogle? <laughs> you know? You're not using Widget McGoogles. How, you're behind the times. Oh, all right. Yeah, I got to update my website. I've forgotten all of my PHP, and I can't update the damn thing now. So if you need some help with that. All right. I'll talk to the folks at Orbit. I think that they were uh, already looking at somebody for me, but I don't know. Okay. Uh, oh, we have 56 viewers now. Oh, nice. nice. All right. We definitely uh, not. Been more. Yeah, Mike, hi, definitely Mike. Definitely not what, Ken? What did you say? I said, I said, uh, definitely too many to fit in the bar. <laughs> so uh, 50, 50 Meyer, people in the bar, that's where it's standing room only. Right. Eugene Meyer says, if you don't want to miss any comments, oh, actually, I can put it up on the screen here. If you don't want to miss any comments, make sure you have live chat selected. YouTube likes to default to top chat. It's a good, awesome. good point. I did not know Thank that. You, Gene. Thank you, Eugene. Uh, let me turn this off. I'll leave that up for a minute. It doesn't look like Eugene. Actually, it does look like Eugene. Hi, Eugene. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a Superman t-shirt, so it definitely looks like Eugene. Definitely Eugene. <laughs> uh, now, how do I turn that off? <laughs> oh, okay. There we go. Uh, Eugene says hi. Mm -hmm. So, we'll do this. That thing is huge. I wish there was a way I could make that smaller. Actually, okay. I mean, it, it depends on the size of the reader screen. It doesn't seem that bad to me. Okay. I'm looking at it on my tiny little MacBook. Yeah, because you're well, well. I mean, it's a little. It's a small screen for us. So, mm -hmm. the only thing this app doesn't do is um, the backgrounds that you can do on Zoom. Mm -hmm. So I like I have this. This I look. It looks like I'm in a closet. I'm actually in my office, but. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, when I'm on Zoom meetings, I, I put uh, the TARDIS in the background. <laughs> so I usually put one of the uh, Museum of Natural History's uh, uh, backgrounds yeah. up. That yeah, or the Miyazaki backgrounds, because uh, Studio Ghibli released some great ones. I haven't so, seen those. So you gonna put? How do you put them on your screen? I mean, uh, in Zoom, you just go into the preferences, and there's a place where you can oh, you can oh, upload yeah, your maybe I'll do that one Zoom. Yeah. Oh, Sarah Pinsker's here. Hello, Sarah. Oh, Sarah's here. <laughs> Amy Goldschlager, hello. She says she's Hi, Amy. Amy. Oh, Eugene says it would be cool to get the KGB bar as a background. Yeah. Yeah, oh, would. Would I, um, you that know, would be a great idea. I, I said this last month or maybe the month before, but I was like, oh, if we keep doing this, maybe I'll just upgrade to the, to the pro subscription for StreamYard, and I think we can actually do green screens and all that mm. fun stuff. So maybe we'll do that because mm. – we Looks don't like know. We're gonna be here for a while. Yeah. Uh, Dream Master says, "I really want to travel in the TARDIS and see what 2021 is like." Me too, Dream Master. <laughs> I'm afraid to see what 2021 yeah, is like right yeah. now. I know. True. <sighs> Hi, Caesar. Oh, Caesar. Hello. Okay. Uh, so for those who are just uh, tuning in now, um, we usually go, we're, we're going to, we'll start the readings around 10 after seven. So we're just hanging out now. If you want to say hello and chat, um, tonight's readers are NK Jemison and Ken Schneier. And hello, you're John. Fiction, uh, not at KGB reading series. 
temporarily on YouTube reading series. Uh, we have a mailing list you can see on the bottom, www.kgbfantasticfiction.org. We send out um, about three emails a month just to remind you of the upcoming readings, uh, little bios of each uh, reader. Um, yeah, it's it's been a good series. We'll get more into it when we do the intro, but uh, definitely subscribe. I forgot to type out, uh, to print out the forthcoming reader, so you'll have to do that. You'll do mm -hmm. that. Okay, yeah, I, we actually, um, well, I need to talk to you about that. We have some holes we need to fill. Artie is here. Hello, Artie. Well, we don't know how, if it's ever going to go live again. <laughs> like, I mean, in person. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Which means, we, which means we could get people from all over the world, actually, which would be kind of fun. It, it is. Um, well, uh, Benjamin Rosenbaum is in Switzerland. Well, he was supposed to come here and then there was a rescheduling issue, but I think now because he's not coming here, we can do it, um, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. anytime. Mm -hmm. But yeah, absolutely. We can get people who, who can't travel. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so there's a link here at the bottom. Uh, if you want to support the KGB bar during the shutdown, you can donate at that link. Mm -hmm. So for those who are not local to New York City, uh, KGB bar is a, a Soviet era themed bar in the um, East Village of Manhattan. Um, it in the uh, McCarthy period, it served as a kind of speakeasy uh, for Ukrainian socialists. And uh, since then, it's become kind of a, a literary establishment in, in New York City. There's, there's um, almost every night of the month. Well, not at the moment, but when it was uh, open. Uh, there was some type of reading, whether it's poetry, fiction, literary fiction, spec fiction, nonfiction, um, yeah. non everything. And um, it was, um, Amy, that's New, New York Times said it was it was one of the uh, best uh, literary venues in New York City. So about, um, where are you from in Europe? You just uh, I'm more about where are you from in Europe? Oh, did you see what Amy said? <laughs> Not at all, Amy. Thank you. Uh, I will. I will tell my assistant that because uh, she helped me pick them out. Oh, we have seventy people watching now. Nice. Very good. Apologies Hi. if you guys hear the sound of fireworks in the background. I don't know if this is happening in your neighborhoods or not, but like in New York, for whatever reason, we are getting fireworks every evening. Yeah. It's like that. That I one guy and everybody in the neighborhood far. that shoots off illegal fireworks for like 12 hours. Oh, wow. So, wow. Yeah, They've been well. shooting it off on the roof. Here. They have the, that uvula, whatever it's called. But I didn't hear it tonight. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe they finally stopped doing it. You know, the sounds at 7 o'clock. Oh, the, the, yeah. Well, I mean, I people aren't really. I didn't hear it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, the the sound of the uh, fireworks can make up for the lack of the the thumping overhead that happens in the bar for real when we have, whenever we have these readings. <laughs> uh, we have Juan from Alameda, California. Hello, Juan. Oh wait, it just scrolled past. Walkabout is from England. Yes. The Stalking mm -hmm. Horses is from Baltimore. Fireworks in Boston, Baltimore too, huh? Uh, Misty Island. from Long Island. Problem okay, well, Kangaroo no action. fireworks in Queens. Oh, no. Also from Queens. Hi, Amanda. DM from Providence. Good crowd. Hi, Jordan. You got fireworks? Where are you living, Jordan? Jordan's in, in the city, isn't he? Is he in Manhattan? I don't know. Hi, Mike. Spain. Someone's in Spain. Chicago. Hey, cool. The fireworks in New York City will make you want to murder someone. <laughs> yeah. I guess I'm just used to it at this point. I barely notice it anymore. Yeah, I heard <laughs> helicopters. I forget when. I don't yeah. know if last night or today, but it was like for ages. Like, well, yeah. I, yeah, I was going to say the frustrating thing is that suddenly we've got police helicopters responding to the damn fireworks. Uh -huh. or, or We've had a lot of protests. Um, and so in some cases, the helicopters are hovering over the protests. But in a lot of cases, I think they're just hovering over neighborhoods looking for fireworks shooters. And I'm like, well, that's a great use of police funds. Yeah, right. Anyway. Hi, Andrew, Andrew, Norman, Oklahoma. Oklahoma, Hi. Northern New Jersey, Brooklyn. 
It looks like we're getting a real location roll call in the chat. Yeah, we got a nice, uh, nice mix of people from all over the place. It's good. Oh, South. Oh, Arnie's in South Carolina. Hi there. Yeah. Denver, Virginia, Spain, Chicago. It's a good crowd. Seventy-one people watching. Nice. Romper room. <laughs> oh. <laughs> what? Um, no. Uh, so I see Amy and Mike and Devin remind me of Romper Room. You've watched Romper Room? I watched Romper Room. You, I, mean, I think Romper Room is a little Romper before Romper my Romper time. Romper 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 yeah, it's probably just feedback. Okay. Um, yeah. The chuckle patch. I don't know. Uh, yeah, that's from the um, the garden. What's it called? The secret, not the secret garden. Someone help me out here. It's Athens, Georgia. Oh, yeah, hello, Athens. Hi, Joe. Is the 40 watts still there in Athens, Georgia? The that was a good, good club. Patch was magic. Music venue. That was, I don't know. That was after my time, I think. The chocolate magic garden. garden. Was right. magic garden. What was the magic yeah, garden? I didn't do that. The chocolate either. Patch. It was, these were like shows in the late 70s, early 80s. Like the was 50s, huh. 60s. Well, the yeah, 70s, but it, early the 80s was went weird. on for a while. It did? Huh. What's that, Laura? I was just saying the 70s was, you know, my, my childhood. So, all right. Well, no, I was doing a Sesame Street and Via Alegre. So yeah, Romper really Room was more early 60s. Ah, yeah. oh, okay. Right. Uh, <laughs> it's a gaming headset. <laughs> yeah, that's where it comes from, <laughs> Eugene. This is my gaming headset. Nice. Ah, it, it keeps you guys from hearing my, my cats whining. Yeah, I might have to put my headset on if if it gets a little loud right now. Because sometimes they AC on in the, in the alley over here. It gets really loud if everyone puts them on, so... Yeah. Um, the Muppets was my childhood. Me too, Dream Master. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, the Muppets. No, the Muppets were after me. Were after me. I was Sherry Lewis and. Did anybody else watch Via Allegra? I never heard of that. Was that just it. a? It only ran in New York, I think, but it was yeah. like a, like a bilingual Spanish program. Um, had really good music. I don't remember. What that was that the seventies? Yeah, it ran on PBS. Um, I, was, I wasn't watching stuff like that till, huh. I mean, I mean 60, that was the early 60s. By the okay. 70s, I stopped watching television. Oh. I, when I was 21 or two, I had gone to college and I stopped, except for Miami Vice. That was the only thing I kept watching. <laughs> I, I can understand that one. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Lamb Chop. Yes, Lamb Chop and Charlie. Yeah. Hmm. Like, so that's Sherry Lewis. That's going back even further. Yes. That's, that's yeah. I did Captain that's Kangaroo, hilarious. Zoom. Oh, I remember Zoom. You want to hear- Zoom had good music too. Jack may join us. My kitties are quiet, but Jack is very impressive. Hopefully he won't show up. <laughs> we yeah, that's what the gaming out. headset is for, just so you don't have to hear Ozzy and Magpie when they decide to start play fighting or- <sighs> anyway. Kukul Fran and Ollie, yes. Kukul Fran and Ollie. Yep. Oh, three, two, one, contact. I love that show. And Andy and then, Divine. And then mysteries it's like you watched Andy Divine. I forget what the show is called. Oh, with Clara and Cat and uh, absolutely. What was it called though? The show. And they always had. Um, Ovia Allegra ended in '81. Oh wow. Okay. Uh, well, it's coming up on seven ten. So should we get started? Yeah. <coughs> you start. Just, turn this off so i'm gonna leave everyone's beautiful faces on the screen and let me just pull up my notes here so um yeah so so uh uh welcome this is um this is fantastic fiction at, at kgb uh my name is matthew kressel and i co-host this series with ellen datlow it's a speculative fiction reading series that um runs every third wednesday of the month uh tonight's guests are N.K. Jemison and Ken Schneier. Uh, we're really excited to have them here. Um, you may have noticed that our name has at KGB. Well, what's KGB? Um, not the 
Soviet um, secret yeah. establishment, uh, but uh, the bar, which um, is a bar in the in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Uh, so the, the KGB bar is a is a Soviet themed bar, uh, Lower East Side of Manhattan. It used to serve as a as I said before, if you tuned in, a speakeasy style meeting place for Ukrainian socialists uh, during the McCarthy period. Um, before the coronavirus shutdown, uh, the bar was host to literary events most nights of the month. Uh, and in 20 years of hosting fantastic fiction, uh, the KGB bar never once charged anyone a cover. Um, we usually ask that the audience buy a drink hard or soft to support the bar, but since they're closed, we're asking our viewers if they can, if you want, if you can afford to, to support the bar by sending payments to them through Fundly. And I'll, I'll put up the uh, URL in a second. Uh, the owner, Dennis Wojcik, promises to um, give a percentage of his tips to the bartender. So let me just put that up here. What happened with your light? Your light just went off and on. Oh, it's probably just my screen. I'm just, oh, it's, it's, right. I'm, I'm switching screens. Hmm. Uh, so um, this, the Fantastic Fiction series itself um, started um, in the late 90s by Terry Bisson and Alice K. Turner. Uh, at the time, they were attempting to bring together mainstream writers with writers of speculative fiction in order to show, in Alice Turner's words, quote, that at a certain level, they were plowing exactly the same field, end quote. In the spring of 2000, editor Ellen Datlow took over for Alice Turner, and in August 2002, Gavin J. Grant, who is the publisher of Small Beer Press, stepped in for Terry Bisson when Terry moved to California. Author Matthew Kressel, that's me, uh, stepped in for Gavin in April of 2008 when the commute from Massachusetts became uh, too much for them. Uh, we do have a mailing list uh, that I hope you can uh, join. Let me just put that up here. There we go. So, um, like I said before, we just send out like two or three emails a month just to remind you of the upcoming readings. We do not spam. We do not sell your, your emails to anybody. It's just, you know, here's who's reading this month. Um, almost there, almost to the readings. Uh, next month, July 15th, uh, we have Mike Allen and I Ooh. think Benjamin Rosenbaum. Now, mm -hmm. I say I think because we had... Um, Ben Ben had switched uh, scheduling because of travel issues, but because of the uh, virus shutdown, uh, I'm not sure if that's still the case. So maybe maybe we. Oh, well, he have gave me his blurb, so he must think he's doing it. Hmm. In that case, he is reading that. I mean, I haven't mentioned to him. By the way, it's online. But okay, yeah, because I, I thought he had switched yeah. at one point in November, but uh, okay. Uh, August nineteenth, we have Michael Liebling and our favorite guest, TBA. Um, yeah, September 16th. Going along with TK. What? Which goes along with TK. Yeah, TK, TBA, they're, they're cousins. September 16th, uh, we have Livia Llewellyn and Craig L. Gidney. Uh, October 21st, we have Laird Barron and Ellen. Did, did that other person whom we can't I, mention? I don't know. I haven't, we haven't. Okay. Everybody should follow up on those people. Yeah, um, so we can't mention that person. November 18th, Cat Rambo. Uh, and also TBA or TK, maybe the cousins reading. Um, so yeah, that's our that's our um, our schedule right now. Um, so uh, this is our fourth month doing the readings over YouTube, and um, yeah, like Ellen and I decided that you know rather than just cancel the series outright, we were like, you know what, let's let's do what everyone else is doing. Let's do it remotely. And it's actually worked out really well. Um, it's a lot so of the K yeah, the KGB bar is pretty small. Um, if you've been there, it's it's a dive bar in the sense, uh, in the very best sense. It's the it's a <laughs> it's a beautiful old bar, and but it's small. It's like I don't know what the capacity is. Maybe thirty five chairs or something. Maybe less. Uh, but people pack it in, so it's standing room only. And, and I know Nora, when you've read there before, not very um, accessible. People have sometimes turned away because they can't get in. So yeah. right now we have almost 90 people watching, and I think that if we were in the live bar, that that wouldn't fit. That and people would be like, "Oh, forget it. It's too crowded. I'm going home, or it's too hot." Yeah. So this yeah. actually is, you know, and, and like we said before, there are many people here who are not from New York who are joining us. So 
uh, welcome uh, people from all over the world, which is which is really wonderful. And uh, you know, uh, if anything positive can come out of this, I think that's it's we're able to reach more people. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, so um, all right, I am going to stop talking and I'm going to try to turn off these banners. Here we go and introduce our first reader. Um, our first reader is Kenneth Schneier. Kenneth Schneier has been nominated for the Nebula and Sturgeon Awards. His fiction has appeared in Lightspeed Magazine, Uncanny Magazine, Strange Horizons, Analog, Beneath Ceaseless Skies, and Clockwork Phoenix. Fairwood Press will release his second collection, Anthems Outside Time and Other Strange Voices, in July. He teaches Shakespeare, constitutional law, science fiction, criminal procedure, and introductory logic to college students in Rhode Island. Here's Ken Schneider. Hi. Um, pleasure to be here. The uh, pleasure, it's a, a complete honor uh, to be here on the same stage with Nora Jemison, who I've been, who I've admired ever since I read uh, Non-Zero Probabilities in 2009. Um, so, uh, as uh, Matt said, uh, this is the, the second collection coming out, uh, Anthems Outside Time and Other Strange Voices. It's uh, going to be released July 14th from Fairwood Press. And uh, I thought I would read uh, two stories from uh, the collection. So they're both relatively short to fit into the, into the reading time. I think there's one actual novella somewhere in the collection, a novelette somewhere in the collection, but most of the stories are pretty short. Anyway, I'm gonna read the first story, uh, which is called Some Pebbles in the Palm, and then I'm gonna read uh, a story about halfway through the collection called I Have Read the Terms of Use. And um, the, the, the subtitle, of course, the Anthems Outside Time and Other Strange Voices, we're going to talk a little bit about voicing later on, um, but I think you, you'll get an idea from listening to these stories as to why I say I'm about strange voices. So this um, this first uh, story, again, it's the first story in the collection, so it's your introduction to the collection, it was originally published in Lightspeed Magazine, and it's called uh, Some Pebbles in the Palm. Once upon a time, there was a man who was born, who lived, and who died. We could leave the whole story at that, except that it would be misleading to write the sentence only once. He was born, he lived, and he died. Was born, lived, died. Born, lived, died. The first few words of a story are a promise. We will have this kind of experience, not that one. Here is a genre. Here is a setting. Here is a conflict. Here is a character. We don't know what is coming next, but we do know what is coming next. We wonder what is coming next. He was born, he lived, and he died. To say that this man did nothing would be false. As a child, he made up a little game where he moved smooth pebbles between the shade of a tree and earth warmed by the sun, and for a few moments the warmth or coolness of the pebble would stand bravely against the heat or cold of its surroundings, making a little zone that thought it could resist entropy. No one else ever played it, but it occupied him for dozens of happy hours. When he grew older, he forgot all about this game, except that every few years the sight of certain white tiny stones made him want to pick them up and in his hand, they felt heavier than they should. As a man of 40, he regularly walked near a patch of gravel that filled him with inexpressible melancholy. The stones are not a symbol. The melancholy was nothing more than the distorted lens through which anyone sees his childhood. Lucky people see lost contentment, safety, and endless wonder. Others see the hand raised in anger, feel the ache in the belly, smell the shit or rotten food or the sour sweat. He was lucky. He was educated and on the manner befitting a person of his time and station. Let's say it was an English public school of 
1840 or so, which would mean that he experienced a certain amount of brutality, a fist not ra raised not in anger, but because fists are supposed to be raised. We can pity him for that, if we like. He pitied himself for it. He fell in love with a young woman whose dark eyes narrowed in concentration when she used two fingers to extract a single seed from a pomegranate. She would hold it between the nail of her first finger and the pad of her second, turning it like a gemstone for perhaps a quarter hour before she put it in her mouth. By that time, its skin had dried and it must have popped like a tiny balloon when she bit into it. Characters with even the faintest whiff of humanity make readers reimagine themselves, whether those characters actually do anything or not. A few seconds ago, you put your first and second fingers together and pictured a pomegranate seed between them. He took up an occupation that interested him. Perhaps he was in the military or a member of the entrepreneurial middle class, a minister of the gospel. He did his job well, sometimes very well. Those for whom he worked praised him outside of his hearing in smoky clubs. And younger men, just learning the trade, looked to him for advice and reassurance. In his job, he had choices to make, and he made them. At the time, those choices seemed important, but they weren't really. Uh, had he made different choices, or had he refused to make choices at all, the world at large, and even his own life, would have gone on more or less the same. Passive protagonists are a mistake. The reader wants the main character to do something. He shouldn't merely experience the world and pass through it. He should act upon it, uh, choose paths that have an impact. Especially this is true of the short story, which is supposed to concern the most important moment in the character's life. Never mind that many people go through their lives more acted upon than acting. That for some, the decisions that make the fundamental differences are never theirs to begin with? What if I had called the protagonist she? He stood beneath the infinite sky with a chill wind pressing against his face, watched dark trees wrestle and contort, and glimpsed the unbridgeable distance between himself and the heavens, between himself and the past. What is man that you are mindful of him? He was fortunate. He never had life and death decisions thrown in his face by an unfriendly providence. We all wish we had such lives. The protagonist should have something at stake, something to gain or lose that's important to him. If there's no reason for the protagonist to care about the outcome, there's no reason for the reader to care either. I could tell you things that mattered. I could choose a, a different main character, a coal miner dying at 30, or someone enslaved in the American South, or a woman, woman under the dominion of men at any time in the last 3,000 years. Then, if she died a pointless death after struggling without hope for years, you could put down the pages thinking you'd learned something. All of those things were going on during this man's life. The dying coal miners, the abused women, they all suffered then. Our hero knew about them. More than this, he cared, uh, said he cared, wept over them. No Ebenezer Scrooge here, no willfully callous miser shutting himself away from his fellow men. When those conscientious gentlemen with a subscription list knocked on his door, he gave handsomely. He voted for the liberal candidate and argued with the friends at his club about relief for the poor and home rule for Ireland. This is where we might expect to read a hint of a, of a tragic flaw, a lack of discipline or a failing of courage, uh, a window into a disaster we're sure will follow, or a challenge to be overcome uh, so that he will find himself elevated and transformed by the end of the story. Yeah, none of that is going to happen. The wife whose concentration on a pomegranate seed had once so enchanted him died of a wasting illness. And he walked from one room to another, from one street to another, counting his footsteps and forgetting the number. His son, his son sent him a letter once every few months, and his daughter came to visit every second Sunday, nodding kindly at everything he said and smiling as if she had actually heard him. 
The powers of his body failed him slowly because he had a good physician, and the best that could be managed in that era, anyhow. He died in the usual mixture of pain, perplexity, and a vague sense of a life well lived that he more or less expected. Less than a mile from that spot, on the same day, a girl of five and a boy of seven coughed out their last breaths on separate filthy street corners, alone and uncomforted, never having met. If bad things are going to happen, they have to happen to people we know and care about. So the author doesn't just tell you that a thousand people died. She makes you acquainted with one particular person. Sorry. Uh, one, one particular person whose loves, hates, hopes, and fears you know and understand, and then that person dies. And you weep the way you'd never weep for the mountain of bodies on the floor of a stadium. Oh, sure, one and a half million died at Auschwitz, or maybe it was four million. It's a number. But show you one pair of baby clothes in the Auschwitz Museum, and you start to sob. The next time he was born, he grew up in the suburbs with the counterculture and the civil rights riots and the anti-war movements and television, and they frightened him. One Late one night, he saw a movie about teenagers locking up all the parents in concentration camps and news anchors told of astronauts screaming on their launch pad, a man shot in a motel, another man who maybe was a president shot in another hotel, and funerals for people killed in riots. It was easy to be scared. During recess at school, he hid in a brick alcove that housed the huge warm HVAC unit, humming along with it and listening to the dissonance when he raised or lowered the pitch of his voice. He built little rockets out of cardboard and balsa, sanding the fins and painting them with the sealant that said dope on the label and wondered if it was the same dope they meant in the public service ads. The rockets went up with a sound like a garden hose splatting on the pavement and most of them were lost on their very first flights. He attended a college full of wealthy campus radicals where socialist rhetoric, feminist separatism, and critical race theory were thrown about by people who mostly forgot about them by the time they turned 30. Joining in made him feel popular and loved, which is what he wanted. When he was 19, his girlfriend told him she was a feminist, and so he decided to become a feminist too. It wasn't as shallow as it sounds. He read a lot and he talked to many people and really believed the things he said. He donated lots of money to organizations that lobbied and agitated for gender equity and justice. When the two of them got married, they had rings made in which they set so many precious stones they'd gathered on a vacation together. The politics felt good and maybe some of the money helped. And maybe one of his maybe his phone call to the right state representative was the tipping point. In fact, none of it was. If he'd never donated, never marched, never spoken, things would have worked out pretty much the same. Most of the time he knew this. He became a loan officer in a bank, like George Bailey in the movie, was able to use his authority to nudge things in the direction of women, people of color, gays, trans people, every oppressed and underrepresented category of person he could think of. He was proud of himself. Of course, the bank had its standards, and there was a limit to how much nudging he could do, and he never went so far as to jeopardize his own position. He pictured what it would be like if he were the one who had to be constantly on guard, lest to be molested or killed, the one channeled into a life of poverty, the one whose culture was harvested, homogenized, sugared, and fed back to him in nauseating swallows. These things made him angry, and he protested them, or at least he chimed in when someone else protested them. Eventually he died, no wiser than he began, as the song goes, and if some prophet out of a novel had been standing over him at that moment, she'd have said, for all the good and evil creation or destruction your li living might have accomplished, you might just as well never have lived at all. He might have protested that that couldn't be true because he had children. But they didn't do anything either. 
Now you think this story is about karma. He keeps getting reborn because he's failing to learn the lesson he needs. And sooner or later, he'll have an epiphany or redemption or something that will make him one, take him one step closer to nirvana or enlightenment. And that's not going to happen either. The wheel of fire keeps turning. He never gets any wiser, never becomes more aware, never takes action to do anything. Not in one lifetime, not in 30. There is no progress, no arc no satisfying or edifying conclusion. While repetition can be a powerful device, it's wasteful and boring unless there is some detectable change between the different instances of action, theme, and symbol. A piece of short fiction is not a chant. It needs continual development and evolution or completion of something that appears more than once. We understood it the first time. We don't need to be told again. The next time he was born, he was a cyborg. The neural link he shared with his fellow creatures allowed him to assess whatever thoughts and feelings they wished to share with him. There was one who was endlessly fascinated by a few grains of sand in the palm of her hand, grains in which she fancied she could see tiny contours, but which would be lost forever if she exhaled near them. Another climbed boulders, gripping the rock with his bare hands, feeling the pressure and pain, and knowing for certain he was alive. Our hero saw what they saw, felt what they felt, and believed he had learned something. These enhancements were available only to that small percentage of the population with the wealth, the technological surroundings, the physical safety to partake of them. Most of the human race was still, even in that advanced time, wrestling with problems of basic nutrition, sanitation, and violence. Of those who did not share his race, his gender, his orientation, his class, his ableness, there were some who did attain the neural links, and they were not shy about uploading experiences for all to understand. They thought that, on, that if only others could feel what they felt, the callous indifference of privilege would melt away. Now you hope for a hand-waving fix for contemporary social problems. This neural link thing, which I haven't explained because I haven't the first idea how it would work, will magically impose empathy on all its users. The courageous oppressed will, perhaps in some noble act of sacrifice, impart the experience of their oppression to the privileged, and the world will transform. No. He felt what they felt, certainly. He experienced their pain, their sorrow, their fear, their anger. In his mind, he smiled when she didn't feel it for fear of what would happen next, always looked over air shoulder, pressed his belly for the food that was not there. He remembered guarding each word lest they utter the wrong syllable and trigger violence. And each time it was done, he switched off the link and wept for the pain and sent messages apologizing for living as one of the oppressors and transferred credit units to the accounts of movements that were trying to make things better. Eventually he died this time too, although life extension methods had progressed considerably and it took longer than it would nowadays. He died disappointed, unhappy with the world, wishing he'd had the moral fiber to do something more than he did. The story goes on and on, you understand how it's going to go. Inconclusive endings frustrate and dissatisfy the reader. The author should not shrink from his responsibility, but should have the guts to choose what happens in the end. Leaving it up to the reader's imagination to speculate on the conclusion is a cop-out. If you're reading this story in the year 2115, and you've made a quick search of my name, by flicking a fingernail or thinking the code for your genie, whatever the hell science fiction sort of thing you do in the 22nd century, you haven't found anything. No achievements, no accomplishments, no victory for humanity that will make me unashamed to die, as they say. Maybe even the names of my parents, wife, and children aren't there. Maybe all you found is this story. I haven't dug in with both feet, both hands, started the revolution, spent my life for the poor, cured the great plague. Maybe nothing I say here matters. You can call me hypocrite. 
if that makes you feel any better. But I'm not really here, am I? These are words on a page, on a screen, on that nifty little implant you're all using in 2115. Maybe I lied about myself. After all, I, I did lie about the protagonist. He's just made up, all 47 of him. Maybe I'm a selfless saint who spends every day trying to better the lot of his fellow creature. Maybe I'm the least privileged person you can imagine, suffering under or within the multidimensional constricting weight of seven different kinds of oppression. By 2115, I'm dead anyway, so what do you even care? I'm atoms on the wind. Maybe I'm the atoms in your fingernail. From where you stand, I'm every bit as fictional as the protagonist of this story. He's not real. I'm not real. Only you are real. So that's that's the first um, uh, the first uh, story in the collection. It's called "Some Pebbles in the Palm," and uh, you get sort of get what I mean by strange voices. And uh, to go even further off into the ozone layer uh, on that one, I'm going to read you something that is probably pretty much unlike any story you've seen. Uh, this is called, uh, I Have Read the Terms of Use. It was originally published in Daily Science Fiction. Um, hold on to your hats. As a condition of the use and enjoyment of the body selected for your use, you agree to the following terms of use. You understand that the aforementioned body is designed for no more than 70, 70 years of operation and that attempts to employ said body for any period beyond the aforementioned duration carries no guarantee that it will function in any capacity. You understand further that we have no control of, over the actions of other vendors and that consequently the body selected for your use may be subject to the actions of other models not within our control, including infection, infestation, deformation, or decomposition before the expiration of the design period. You understand further that we have no control over the actions of other licensees, and that we are not responsible for the uses to which they put the body's license to them, and that therefore we have no responsibility for murder, rape, mayhem, enslavement, oppression, or heartbreak, thereby caused to the body selected for your use. You agree not to reverse engineer the body selected for your use or any of its component subsystems. You agree that its ultimate design and origins will remain our proprietary trade secrets, and that you will make no efforts to discover the methods, materials, or first causes we employed in its development. You understand that any efforts on your part to discover, deduce, or decode the origins of this body will lead to false or misleading conclusions concerning our purposes and plans, and that we have no obligation to correct or otherwise respond to such conclusions. You understand that the body selected for your use is, com is a component of a larger system, the species, which is itself a component of a larger system, the planet, which is itself a component of a larger system, the cosmos. You agree that the function of each component within its system and its interaction with other components in the system are our trade secrets and will not be disclosed to you at any time for any reason. You understand that we will not respond to any inquiries concerning those functions and interactions, and that any attempt by you to determine those functions or interactions will breach these terms of use. You agree that you will be born into a race, class, gender identity, sexuality, state of health, and place that will give you no ability to control the circumstances of your own life or affect any change for its improvement, and that whether you are valuable or value less, skilled or unskilled, ugly or beautiful, will depend on the whims of licensees far away and utterly unknown to you. In the alternative, depending on the availability of various styles, colors, and options, you agree that you will be born into such privilege that you will have no awareness of the customs, preferences, tastes, joys, hopes, fears, or sorrows of any licensees not nearly identical to yourself, and that should you obtain information pertaining to your own acquiescence, responsibility, or culpability for, without limitations, the deprivations, pain, illnesses, dismemberment, torture, rape, or murder of licensees not nearly identical to yourself, you will treat such information as our intellectual property and none of your business, and will, to the extent practicable, understand such matters to be no fault of yours and contrary to your own good intentions. 
You understand that the body selected for your use is provided with a number of factory settings concerning the cultural norms under which it will operate, the starting conditions. You understand that the starting conditions will be predetermined by existing relationships of power and wealth within the culture of which said body is a component. You agree that the starting conditions will determine your perceptions of morality and ethics and that those perceptions will regard the existing power and wealth relationships of said culture as natural, appropriate, functional, and beneficial. You agree that you will not use the body selected for your use to infringe upon, alter, or amend any of the starting conditions and that the distribution of goods, services, nutrition, medicine, affection, sexual gratification, and emotional support shall be substantially similar when you surrender the body selected for your use as when said body was initially provided. You agree to experience persistent confusion and disorientation concerning right action, wrong action, your obligations to your family, friends, community, nation, and the species, the planet, and the cosmos, resulting in paralysis and inactivity concerning any matter of ethical or moral significance. In the alternative, depending on market conditions and supplies, you agree to experience irrational certainties and extreme passions concerning such matters, in which case you have sole responsibility for any resultant damage. You understand that we disclaim any representations or warranties other than those contained in these terms of use, and that no oral, psychological, historical, literary, or religious assurances you may have received from persons purporting to be our agents will be binding on us. You understand further that we expressly disclaim any implied warranties, including without limitation, any implied warranty of survivability, likability, employability, health, sanity, or fitness for a particular purpose. You agree to hold us harmless for any direct, consequential, or incidental damages that may result from noncompliance with any assurances or implied warranties not contained in these terms of use. You agree that these terms of use shall be subject to such natural, moral, and spiritual laws as we have previously enacted, and that it is your responsibility to acquaint yourself with such laws. You agree that disputes concerning these terms of use shall be resolved by adjudicators of our choosing in a time and manner that seems best to us. You agree that we may alter these terms of use on one generation's notice to you. You may refuse such alterations by surrendering the body selected for your use at such time and place as we shall designate. Any use of this body, including but not limited to breathing, eating, drinking, sleeping, working, playing, loving, or hating, shall be deemed acceptance of these terms of use and shall be irrevocably binding upon you and your heirs, devisees, grantees, and assigns forever. So that's, uh, I have read the terms of use, and I, I was a little selective in the stories that I read to you. I, I, I wanted to, um, I wanted to give you the, the <laughs> most, uh, some of the, weir the weirdest uh, stories. There are some that I'm going to there That's why I didn't clap. <laughs> I, I had I had everyone muted, but we were all well clapping. Okay. <laughs> yes. Great. Great job. So I think we'll that was break lovely. now. A break like five minutes or so. Both pieces were lovely. Thank you, Nora. Yeah, and you did a great yeah. reading. I, I will not be looking at the camera as much as you because I lose track of lines when I do that. I'm not good at that. I don't know how you mastered that technique yet. I, 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 lost, <laughs> uh, I lost track of lines a couple of times, actually. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> we just slow down on that sangria, Ken. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. Now I get to speed up the sangria because I'm done. Right, right. <laughs> Nora's reading. Okay. Enjoy. Uh, all right, so we're, uh, we'll be back in uh, about five minutes. Uh, I'm going to mute everybody, and we'll be back in five minutes with N N.K. Jemison. Okay. Put up a candle. <laughs> no candle tonight, Ellen. Sorry.
Okay. Was that so five minutes? Wow. No, okay. it, it wasn't five, but every, everyone sat down, so I figured I would put the mic back. Well, where's our candle? Why didn't our candle go? Well, my, uh, Christine has the laptop tonight, so I couldn't, like, yeah, I can't yeah. tilt my desktop down to do the candle. I could just hold it up. The candle. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I got to figure out how to do a background or something. It's mm -hmm. okay. Anyway, welcome yeah. back, everybody. Three Welcome minutes. Back. It was only three minutes. Should we wait two minutes in case people? Yeah, are yeah. Ready? We'll wait. Wait for people okay. who. All right. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Yeah, we'll we'll wait for full five. We'll wait till seven. We're, 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 we're on though. <laughs> Great readings, Ken. Very Thank very you. good delivery. Thank you for that. That was really good. And I love that you, you. said uh, you enjoyed. Um, Oh my gosh! What was the name of the story that you said of mine that you liked? Uh, uh, non-zero uh, probabilities. Non-zero probabilities. Yeah. Thank you. Thank that was the you. The first of your stories that I that I read, but I read many more. Thank uh, you. And, and of course, several mm -hmm. of your novels. Um, you know, I didn't realize, but I had read your first story in Clark's World uh, a while ago. So, uh, I think it was Clark's World. Oh, uh, probably Lightspeed. Oh, okay. Hmm. All right. I have terrible memory. Um, but I remembered the story once I started to hear it. So, and I liked it a lot. So thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. That means a lot. Well, I almost read uh, Non-Zero Probabilities tonight, but whoops, I decided to do uh, The Ones Who Stay and Fight instead. Mm. Seemed a little more mm. apropos to the time. Right. Yeah, good choice. Yeah, so. Plus, also, I think I read Non-Zero Probabilities at KGP um, right. in the past. <laughs> so. Well, I heard it. Uh, I heard Kate Baker read it, of course. Oh, she did such a good job. Yeah, I'm not nearly as good as the people that they've they've uh, asked to do my readings. So, oh well, I'll do the best I can. I'm sure you'll be. Oh, don't tell yourself short. Sure. You yeah. You're a great reader. So. Well, how do you how do you do the looking at the camera thing? How do you manage to not lose your line? For me? Yeah. Again. Um, it's been, it's it's a you know so I was a theater major. And, oh. um, and there's a there's a there's a, there's a trick to it, and basically you you have your first of all I have my finger on the text, so I'm, I I I I don't lose it, but you know, but looking at the audience is is an old habit. Mm -hmm. so. I do read ahead, and I'm sometimes able to read far enough ahead that I can glance up for like a hot second, but like you had like face action going on and everything. I could yeah. <laughs> that's the theater major. <laughs> yeah. Oh great. Should we start? I'm gonna have to turn this down so okay. I can get the sure. text. All right. Welcome back to Fantastic Fiction at KGB. Our next guest is N.K. Jemison, who is a New York Times bestselling author of speculative fiction, short stories, and novels. In 2018, she became the first author to win three best novel Hugos in a row for her Broken Earth trilogy. She has also won a Nebula Award, two Locus Awards, and a number of other honors. Her latest novel, The City We Became, is out now from Orbit Books. She lives and writes in Brooklyn. So go for it. Uh, because someone asked me what oh. my t-shirt design was. Oh, okay. No, no, there, that's, that's what I'm wearing. Um, I got it from going to the premiere when it happened here in New York. <laughs> but anyway, or trying to go to the premiere, I didn't actually get it. All right, so um, I am going to be reading uh, from uh, the first story in my own short story collection, uh, How Long Till Black Future Month. Um, the short story I'll be reading will be called The Ones Who Stay and Fight. Um, I do have a brand new novel out, uh, The City We Became from Orbit Books. Um, but I also just finished a virtual book tour where I have read this book so many times. So, um, so I need, I need a break. I need to read something else. And also I hate reading, uh, uh novel excerpts when I'm doing KGB. Um, I like to do a nice, complete, coherent short story. So the ones who stay and fight, it will be. Um, now this story, for those who do not realize already, is uh, in conversation with uh, Ursula K. Le Guin's famous short story, uh, The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas. Uh, okay. The Ones Who Stay and Fight. It's the day of good birds in the city of Umhalat. The day is a local custom, silly and random as so many local customs can be and yet beautiful by the same token. 
It has little to do with birds, a fact about which locals cheerfully laugh because that too is how local customs work. It is a day of fluttering and flight regardless, where pennants of brightly dyed silk plume forth from every window, and delicate drones of copper wire and feather glass, made for this day and flown on no other, waft and buzz on the wind. Even the monorail car cars trail stylized flamingo feathers from their rooftops, although these are made of feather glass too, since real flamingos do not fly at the speed of sound. Umhalat sits at the confluence of three river rivers and an ocean. This places it within the migratory path of several species of butterfly and hummingbird as they travel north to south and back again. At the day's dawning, the children of the city come forth, most wearing wings made for them by parents and kind old aunties. Not all aunties are actually aunties, but in Umhalat, anyone can earn auntiehood. This is a city where numberless aspirations can be fulfilled. Some wings are organza stitched onto school backpacks. Some are quilted cotton stuffed with dried flowers and clipped to jacket shoulders. Some few have been carefully glued together from dozens of butterflies' discarded wings, but only those butterflies that died naturally, of course. Thus adorned, children who can run through the streets do so, leaping off curbs and making whooshing sounds as they pretend to fly. Those who cannot run instead ride special drones, belted and barred and double-checked for safety, which gently bounce them into the air. It's only a few feet, although it feels like the height of the sky. But this is no awkward dystopia where all are forced to conform. Adults who refuse to give up their childhood joys wear wings too, though theirs tend to be more abstractly constructed. Some are invisible. And those who follow faiths which forbid the emulation of beasts, or those who simply do not want wings, need not wear them. They are all honored for this choice, as much as the soarers and flutterers themselves, for, without contrasts, how does one appreciate the different forms that joy can take? Oh, and there is such joy here, friend. Street vendors sell tiny, custard-filled cakes shaped like jewel beetles, and people who've waited all year wolf them down while sucking air to cool their tongues. Artisans offer cleverly mechanized paper hummingbirds for passers-by to throw. The best ones blur as they glide. As the afternoon of the day grows long, Umhelat's farmers arrive, invited as always to be honored alongside the city's merchants and technologers. By all three groups' efforts does the city prosper, but when aquifers and rivers dip too low, the farmers move to other lands and farm there, or change from corn husking to rice paddying and fishery feeding. The management of soil and water and chemistry are intricate arts, as you know, but here they have been perfected. Here in Umhelat, there is no, no hunger. Not among the people, and not for the migrating birds and butterflies when they dip down for a taste of savory nectar. And so farmers are particularly celebrated on the Day of Good Birds. The parade winds through the city, farmers ducking their gazes or laughing as their fellow citizens offer salute. Here is a portly woman waving a hat of chicken feathers that someone has gifted her. There is a reedy man in a coverall, nervously plucking at the brooch he bears, covered and lacquered to look like a ladybug. He has made it himself and hopes others will think it fine. They do. And here, this woman, tall and strong and bare of arm, her sleek brown scalp dotted with implanted silver studs, wearing a fine uniform of storm cloud damask. See how she moves through the crowd, grinning with them, helping up a child who has fallen. She encourages their cheers and their delight, speaking to this person in one language and that person in another. Umhalat is a city of polyglots. She reaches the front of the crowd and immediately spies the reedy man's ladybug, whereupon, with delighted eyes and smile, she makes much of it. She points, and others see it too, which makes the reedy man blush terribly. But there is only kindness and genuine pleasure in the smiles, and gradually the reedy man stands a little taller, walks, a little, walks with a wider stride. He has made his fellow citizens happier, and there is no finer virtue by the customs of this gentle, rich land. The slanting afternoon sun stretches golden over the city, reflecting light sparkling along its mica-flecked walls and laser-faceted embossings. A breeze blows up from the sea, tasting of brine and mineral minerals, so fresh that a spontaneous cheer wafts along the crowded parade route. 
Young men by the waterfront, busily stirring great vats of spiced mussels and pans of rice and peas and shrimp, cook faster, for it is said in Umhilat that the smell of the sea wakes up the belly. Long, young women on street corners bring out sitars and synthesizers and big wooden drums, the better to get the crowd dancing the young men's way. When people stop, too hot or thirsty to continue, there are glasses of fresh tamarind lime juice. Elders sell the st staff, I'm sorry, elders staff the stop, <laughs> elders staff the shops that sell this, though they also give away the juice if a person is much in need. There are always souls needing drum beats and tamarind in Umhelat. Joyous. It is a steady joy that fills the city, easy to speak of. But ah, though I have tried, it is most difficult to describe accurately. I see the incredulity in your face. The difficulty lies partly in my lack of words and partly in your lack of understanding because you have never seen a place like Umhelat. And because I am myself only an observer, not yet privileged to visit. Thus, I must try harder to describe it so that you might embrace it, too. How can I illuminate the people of Umhelat? You have seen how they love their children and how they honor honest, clever labor. You have perhaps noted that there are many elders, for I have mentioned them in passing. In Umhelat, people live long and richly, with good health for as long as fate and choice and medicine permits. Every child knows opportunity, Every parent has a life. There are some who go without housing, but they can have an apartment if they wish. Here, where the spaces under the bridges are swept daily and benches have light padding for comfort, they do not live badly. If these itinerant folk dwell also in delusions, they are kept from weapons or places that might do them harm. Where they risk disease or injury, they are prevented or cared for if matters get out of hand. We shall speak more of the caretakers soon. And so this is Umhelat, a city whose inhabitants simply care for one another. That is a city's purpose, they believe, not merely to generate revenue or energy or products, but to shelter and nurture the people who do these things. What have I forgotten? Oh, it is the thing that will seem most fantastic to you, friend, the variety. The citizens of Umhelat are so many and so wildly different in appearance and origin and development. People in this land come from many others, and it shows in sheen of skin, or kink of hair, or plumpness of lip and hip. If one wanders the streets where the workers and artisans do their work, there we go. Uh, they are slightly more... I lost my line. Okay. If one wanders the streets where the workers and artisans do their work, they are slightly more, there are slightly more people with dark skin. If one strolls the corridors of the executive tower, there are a few extra done in pale. There is history rather than malice in this, and it is still being actively, intentionally corrected, because the people of Umhalat are not naive believers in good intentions as a solution to all ills. No, there are no worshippers of mere tolerance here, nor desperate grovelers for that grudging pittance of respect which is diversity. Umhalashans are learned enough to understand that what must be done, oh, I'm sorry, Umhalashans are learned enough to understand what must be done to make the world better and pragmatic enough to actually enact it. Does that seem wrong to you? It should not. The trouble is that we have a bad habit, encouraged by those concealing ill intent, of insisting that people already suffering should be afflicted with further unnecessary pain. This is the paradox of tolerance, the treason of free speech. We hesitate to admit that some people are just fucking evil and need to be stopped. This is Umhelat, after all, and not that barbaric America. This is not Omelas, a tick of a city, fat and happy with its head buried in a tortured child. My accounting of Umhelat is an homage, true, but there's nothing for you to fear, friend. And so how does Umhelat exist? How can a city possibly survive? How can such a city possibly survive, let alone thrive? Wealthy, with no poor, advanced, with no war, a beautiful place where all souls know themselves beautiful. It cannot be, you say. Utopia, how banal. It's a fairy tale, a thought exercise. Crabs in a barrel, dog eat dog, oppression Olympics. It would not last, you insist. It could never be in the first place. 
Racism is natural, so natural that we will call it tribalism to insinuate that everyone does it. Sexism is natural, and homophobia is natural, and religious, religious intolerance is natural, and greed is natural, and cruelty is natural, and savagery and fear and, 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 and. Impossible, you hiss, your fists slowly clenching at your sides. How dare you? What have these people done to make you believe such lies? What are you doing to me to suggest that it is possible? How dare you? How dare you? Oh, friend, I fear I have offended. My apologies. Yet, how else can I convey Om Halat to you, when even the thought of a happy, just society raises your ire so? Though I confess I am puzzled as to why you are so angry. It's almost as if you feel threatened by the very idea of equality. Almost as if some part of you needs to be angry, needs unhappiness and injustice. But do you? Do you? Do you believe, friend? Do you accept the day of good birds, the city, the joy? No? Then let me tell you one more thing. Remember the woman, so tall and brown, so handsome and bald, so loving in her honest pleasure, so fine in her storm cloud gray. She is one of many wearing the same garb, garb committed to the same purpose. Follow her now as she leaves behind the crowd and walks along the biofiber paved side streets into the shadows. Beneath a skyscraper that floats a few meters off the ground, oh, it is perfectly safe. Umhalat has controlled gravity for generations now. She stops. There two others await, one Gethin, one male, both clad in gray damask too. They are also bald, their studded heads agleam. They greet each other warmly with hugs where those are welcomed. They are no one special, just some of the many people who work to ensure the happiness and prosperity of their fellow citizens. Think of them as social workers, if you like. Their role is no different from that of social workers anywhere. Word has come of a troubling case, and this is why they gather, to discuss it and make a difficult decision. There are wonders far greater than a few floating skyscrapers in Umhalat, you see. And one of these is the ability to bridge the distances between possibilities, what we would call universes. Anyone can do it, but almost no one tries. That is because, due to a quirk of space-time, the only world that people in Umhalat can reach is our own. And why would anyone from this glorious place want to come anywhere near our benighted hellscape? Again, you seem offended. Oh, friend, you have no right to be. In any case, there's little danger of travel. Even Umhalat has not successfully found a way to reduce the tremendous energy demands of macroscale planar trans transversal. Only wave particles can move from our world to theirs and back again. Only information. Who would bother? Ah, but you forget. This is a land where no one hungers, no one is left ill, no one lives in fear, and even war is almost forgotten. In such a place, buoyed by the, the luxury of safety and comfort, people may seek knowledge solely for knowledge's sake. But some knowledge is dangerous. Umhalat has been a worse place, after all, in its past. Not all of its peoples, so disparate in origin and custom and language, came together entirely by choice. The city had a different civilization once, one which might not have upset you so. Poor thing. There, there. Remnants of that time dot the land all around the city, ruined and enormous and half-broken. Here a bridge, there a great truck, on its back a rusting, curve-sided thing that ancient peoples referred to by the exotic term missile. In the distance, the skeletal remains of another city, once just as vast as Umhalat, but never so lovely. Works such as these encumber all the land, no more and no less venerable to the Umhalashans than the rest of the landscape. Indeed, every young citizen must be reminded of these things upon coming of age, and told carefully curated stories of their nature and purpose. When the young citizens learn this, it is a shock almost incomprehensible in that they literally lack the words to comprehend such things. The languages spoken in Umhalat were once our languages, yes, for this world was once our world. It was not so much parallel as the same back then. You might still recognize the languages, but... What would puzzle you is how they speak 
and how they don't. Oh, some of this will be familiar to you in concept at least, like terms for gender that mean neither he nor she, and the condemnation of words meant to slur and denigrate. And yet you will puzzle over the Umalashan's choice to retain descriptive terms for themselves like kinky-haired or fat or deaf. But these are just words, friend, don't you see? Without the attached contempt, such terms have no more meaning than if horses could proudly introduce themselves as palomino or miniature or hairy-footed. Difference was never the problem in and of itself. And Umhalashans still have differences with each other, of opinion and otherwise. Of course they do. They're people. But what shocks the young citizens of Umhalat is the realization that once those differences of opinion involve differences in respect. That once value was ascribed to some people and not others. That once humanity was acknowledged for some and not others. It's the day of good birds in Umhalat, where every soul matters. And even the idea that some might not is anathema. This, then, is why the social workers of Umhalat have come together, because someone has breached the barrier between worlds. A citizen of Umhalat has listened on equipment you would not recognize, but which records minute quantum perturbations excited by signal wavelengths to our radio. He has watched our television. He has followed our social media, played our videos, liked our selfies. We are remarkably primitive compared to Umhalat. Time flows the same in both worlds, but people there have not wasted themselves on crushing one another into submission, and this makes a remarkable difference. So anyone can do it. Build a thing to traverse the worlds, like building your own ham radio. Easy. Which is why there is an entire underground industry in Umhalat. Ah, crime. Now you believe a little more. Built around information gleaned from the strange alien world that is our own. Pamphlets are written and distributed. Art and whispers are traded. The forbidden is so seductive, is it not? Even here, where only things that cause harm to others are called evil. The information gleaners know that what they do is wrong. They know this is what destroyed the old cities. And indeed, they are horrified at what they hear through the speakers, see on the screens. They begin to perceive that ours is a world where the notion that some people are less important than others has been allowed to take root and grow until it buckles and cracks the foundations of our humanity. How could they, the gleaners exclaim of us? Why would they do such things? How can they just leave those people to starve? Why do they not listen when that one complains of disrespect? What does it mean that these ones have been assaulted and no one, no one cares? Who treats other people like that? And yet, even amid their shock, they share the idea. The evil spreads. So the social workers of Umhalat stand, talking now over the body of a man. He is dead, early, unwilling, with a beautifully crafted pike jammed through his spine and heart. The spine to make it painless, the heart to make it quick. This is, the only one, this is only one of the weapons carried by the social workers, and they prefer it because the pike is silent, because there was no shot or ricochet, no crack or sizzle, no scream. No one else will come to investigate. The disease has taken one poor victim, but it need not claim more. In this manner is the contagion contained in a moment, in a moment. Beside the man's body crouches a little girl. She's curly-haired, plump, blind, brown, tall for her age. Normally a boisterous child, she weeps now over her father's death, and her tears run hot with the injustice of it all. She heard him say, I'm sorry. She heard the social workers show the only mercy possible. But she isn't old enough to have been warned of the consequences of breaking the law, or to understand that her father knew those consequences and accepted them. So to her, what has happened has no purpose or reason. It is a senseless, monstrous, and impossible thing called murder. I'll get back at you, she says between sobs. I'll make you die the way you made him die. This is an unthinkable thing to say. Something is very wrong here. She snarls. How dare you? How dare you? The social workers exchange looks of concern. They are contaminated themselves, of course. It's permitted and frankly unavoidable in their line of work. 
impossible to dam a flood without getting wet. There are measures in place. The studs on their scalps, well, in our own world, those who volunteered to work in leper colonies were once venerated and imprisoned with them. The social workers know, therefore, that for incomprehensible reasons, this girl's father has shared the poison of knowledge with her, of the poison knowledge of our world with her. An uncontaminated citizen of Umhalat would have asked why, after the initial shock and horror, because they would expect a reason. There would be a reason. But this girl has already decided that the social workers are less important than her father, and therefore the reason doesn't matter. She, does, she believes that the entire city is less important than one man's selfishness. Poor child. She is nearly septic with the taint of our world. Nearly. But then our social worker, the tall brown one who got a hundred strangers to smile at a handmade ladybug, crouches and takes the child's hand. What? What surprises you? Did you think this would end with the cold-eyed slaughter of a child? There are other options, and this is Umhalat, friends, where even a pitiful diseased child matters. They will keep her in quarantine and reach out to her for many days. If the girl accepts the hand, listens to them, they will try to explain why her father had to die. She's early for the knowledge, but something must be done, do you see? Then together they will bury him with their own hands if they must, in the beautiful garden that they tend between caseloads. This garden holds all the um Umhalashans who broke the law. Just because they have to die as deterrents doesn't mean they can't be honored for the sacrifice. But there is only one treatment for this toxin once it gets into the blood. Fighting it. Tooth and nail, spear and claw, up close and brutal. No quarter can be given. No parole. No debate. The child must grow and learn and become another social worker fighting an endless war against an idea but she will live and help others and find meaning in that if she takes the woman's hand. Does this work for you at last, friend? Does the possibility of harsh enforcement add enough realism? Are you better able to accept this post-colonial utopia now that you see its bloody teeth? Ah, but they did not choose this battle, the people of Umhalat, today. Their ancestors did when they spun lies and ignored conscience in order to profit from others' pain. Their greed became a philosophy, a religion, a series of nations all built on blood. Umhalat has chosen to be better, but it too must perform blood sacrifice to keep true evil at bay. And now we come to you, my friend, my little soldier. See what I've done? So insidious, these little thoughts both going, way, going both ways along the quantum path. Now, perhaps, you will think of Umhalat and wish. Now you might finally be able to envision a world where people have learned to love as they have learned in our world to hate. Perhaps you will speak of Umhalat to others and spread the notion farther still, like joyous birds migrating on trade winds. It's possible. Everyone, even the poor, even the lazy, even the undesirable, can matter. Do you see how just the idea of this provokes utter rage in some? That is the infection defending itself. Because if enough of, enough of, ugh. Because if enough of us believe a thing is possible, then it becomes so. And then, who knows? War, maybe. The fire of fever and the purging scourge. No one wants that, but is not the alternative to lie helpless, spotty, and blistered and heaving until we all die. So don't walk away. The child needs you too, don't you see? You also have to fight for her now that you know she exists, or walking away is meaningless. Here, here is my hand. Take it, please. Good. Good. Now, let's get to work. That's it. Yes. You're still mute. Unmute us. Unmute us. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Tamarind lime juice. I have, a, I have a question, and maybe I missed it, but what if the child doesn't take their hand? Ah, I leave that for the audience to consider. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, in my head, they will keep asking, um, mm -hmm. and they will continue. There's no time limit on it. 
Um, they may keep asking her for the rest of her natural life, but uh, she will be prevented from spreading the contagion in the meantime. So. Well, thank you, Well, both of you. Sure. Um, someone in the chat mentioned tamarind lime juice. Um, I, in my neighborhood, uh, actually my old neighborhood, Crown Heights, they have a drum circle every Sunday. And there are often uh, sellers out there with homemade juices that they, they put together. And I had some tamarind lime juice once and my whole world <laughs> transformed. <laughs> so I put it into like stories, every other story now. Can you make it yourself? How would you get no, it? No, no, I don't know how. Awesome. I, I need to figure out how to do it. So now sometimes I go to the drum circle just to get the tamarind lime juice. <laughs> the drumming is good too, but like <laughs> I have an ulterior motive. <laughs> Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm here for the lime juice. Yeah, right. Um, 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 so we're going to do a little Q&A now. Um, so while everybody um, thinks of some really good questions to ask our readers, uh, I'm going to just start um, start with Ken really quick. Um, oh, why yeah. other strange voices? Why did you pick that? So that was... I was oh, you want to ask, Alan? You, no, you just did. It's okay. Why um, do I have the voice? No, I'm. It's okay. All right, go ahead, Ken. Yeah, because because. Sorry, I, there's a little delay. It's, it's, it's okay. Yeah, I saw that. Because I'm. Um, for me, it's it's always the voice that comes first. Um, I, I I'd like to be able to write to an idea, but I almost never do. I almost always write to the voice. Um, so I know how the voice sounds and what the voice thinks and more or less what the voice is writing about. And so for this reason, I wind up writing a lot of stories where the voice is really, really weird, you know? So a lot of found document stories, a lot of um, narrators who don't have a clue as to what the story is about, a lot of narrators who don't even think they're telling a story. Um, um, and again, I mentioned, you know, ordinary, ordinary, uh, voices too, um, but um, but even then with the twist. I mean, one of the things that I really admired about the the, the fifth season, and one of the things that um, really got me thinking about it was the particular way in which the second person was used, mm. and the the there was. To my way of thinking, when I heard it, because I listened to it on audiobook, it sounded like there was always an implied harsh judgment behind that voice. And I was wondering to myself whether that is a necessary component of a second person narrator. Or you just read story a, a story that did not show that mm. harsh judgment. So mm, no. true. Yeah. True. Although that's not, that wasn't quite so much a, a second person narrative, though. I mean, there was second well, person. Technically, in. but yeah, you're right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so I, I think about voice a lot. And so, uh, so, and so these, 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 these stories uh, have a lot of different voicing in them. So that, that's why I have the strange voices. I really like And the, what's the your next, what are you working on? Um, what I'm working on at the moment is I have, I have like three different irons in the fire at the moment. I always have a lot of different stories uh, going on at once. Uh, one is an indirect dialogue where what's really going on is what's being spoken of. One is just a kind of a, a cute, weird Western. And one is a, um, a story that I haven't quite gelled in my mind yet, but I, but I, there are going to be, there are gonna be three or maybe four different narrators. And the and the main thing about those narrators is that they are going to be in sharp disagreement with each other over what the story is. Cool. Uh, yeah. I love the metafictional aspect of the first story that you read. Yeah. Like I, I was I was sitting there like, but does my story do that? Oh <laughs> so, um, it's a good synchronicity. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. great. It was a. We Thank always you. seem to have these congruences with KGB yeah. story. I don't know yeah. why. It's luck. It's yeah. synchronicity. Mm -hmm. uh, while the audience thinks of uh, questions to ask on the live chat, um, Ellen, you want to ask Nora some questions? Sure. Um, do you consider Unhalat a utopia? 
people ask me this question uh, whenever they, they talk about this story. And no, I don't believe in utopias. I don't think utopias exist. Um, I think I think utopias are relative and dystopias are relative. Um, and um, like, you know, a lot of people um, don't seem to realize that our world has been a dystopia for, for certain kinds of people for a very long time, right? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Okay. Just, but, but, that's good. Um, but so, you know, a lot of people don't seem to realize that our world has been a dystopia for basically as long as it's existed. Um, it's just a question of your perspective. Um, and I think the same would apply to a utopia as well. Um, to the people in Umhalat who never uh, crossed that dimensional boundary, sure, it's probably great for them. Um, anybody else? <coughs> you okay, Alan? Alan? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. It's like, no, no, it's okay. I was just going to say you might want to mute while you're. Oh yeah, can you mute me? I, I'll I'll mute you. Okay, Ellen Ellen's muted. Um, okay. Like throw sorry. up a sign if if you're not I okay. Know, yeah, like like, <laughs> okay. like this if, if you need to call yeah. you an ambulance or something. <laughs> um, Ken, I want to ask you. Um, tell tell us a little bit about your writing process. Um. Uh, it's it's utterly utterly haphazard. Um, I have uh, a document that I just call story ideas that is now the length of a short novel. Um, that is nothing more than individual paragraphs of things that occur to me, and mostly nothing happens. I throw the paragraphs into the thing. I forget about them, and every once in a while I'll read the document and see if anything comes up, and a scene will come or uh, a couple of scenes will come and or even maybe 6,000 words will come and then nothing more will come. <laughs> and I put it away and I look at it six months later, I look at it a year later, I look at it. I mean, I've got stories, the total composition of which took me like five years, mm. you know, and these are short stories, you know, but it's not the only thing I'm working on. It's like I've got all these things happening at the same time. But for some reason, it's very rare for the whole story to gel for me immediately. Actually, some pebbles in the palm did. I mean, that story, that first story, actually I wrote more or less in one sitting. Um, same thing with the second one. Um, but that's, that's the exception for me. And usually when I'm able to write something in one sitting, what comes out is something that actually scares me a little bit and mm. is disturbing because I think I've accessed some part of my unconscious uh, that I don't, I don't like to think about. Yeah, okay, I was uh, gonna yeah. say cool, but that doesn't sound cool. <laughs> well, it's it's cool artistically. It's just not cool personally. Oh, I don't think I've ever written a story in one sitting. I wish. We have a question for for Nora. Although maybe not. <laughs> Jackie Paris, uh, were the social workers in your story those like the girl who had to make a choice to either fight the infection or be terminated, or could they be anyone? They could be anyone. Um, and I, I left that deliberately ambiguous because I wanted people to kind of bring their own baggage to it. But if you want to know what's what my head canon is, um, you know, it's entirely possible that the guy with the handmade ladybug might have decided that he wanted to spread more joy than a ladybug could do. Um, and he wanted to transition from the honored uh, position of being a farmer to the honored position of being a social worker. Anybody could do it, but it, the, the position entails certain sacrifices and they are told of those up front. <laughs> Someone's well, coveting my uhura. Okay, no, I was wondering, um, <laughs> are you thinking of writing more, have you written or do you want to write more stories in that universe? Was that for me or? Can you, I? Nora. Oh. No, no, uh, that was purely, uh, like I said, that story was written as a, as a response to the ones who walk away from Omalas. Um, and, you know, I'm no, I'm no Le Guin, but I mean, I just wanted to kind of, when I read that story, it makes me feel powerful things like most people who read that story mm -hmm. feel. Um, it's one of the reasons why it's one of the most famous short stories in science fiction, number really literature. Um, and I decided to try and write what I had as a reaction to that. I mean, it was also partly that um, I realized I could not imagine what a world without bigotry looked like. And I, I had been struggling for a very long time to kind of try and like, what would, what would such a world look like? What would, 
how would they live? How would they function? Um, and, you know, I'm supposed to be able to imagine this. Science fiction writers are supposed to be able to imagine anything. And I literally couldn't. Mm. Um, and uh, so I needed to kind of basically speak to the Omelas story in order to kind of reflect. Mm -hmm. And in that way, I was able to pull up something. Uh, Ken, we have a question from Lucas Cole Tobias. <laughs> How did you know? Is this someone I you did. know? Yes, I did. Yes, this is someone too. I know. Okay. <laughs> How did you know so certainly that the reader would touch their first and second fingers together to imagine holding the pomegranate seed? I didn't, <laughs> but I thought it was likely. Um, because um, uh, at least in my reading life, when I'm given a description that is that physically concrete, I find myself wanting to test myself against it, right? So someone says, you put your first and second two fingers together, you put a pomegranate seed, it's very hard not to want to think about it, right? To think about what that would, uh, what that would be like. I mean, it was a gimmick, right? Um, but part of what's going on in that story is the voice, the narrative voice, is reminding you over and over again that you're being manipulated, mm -hmm. right? Um, to, and, and, and the moment that you get even a few inches away mm -hmm. of being, you know, in, uh, submerged in the story, and and the idea is that you would get submerged, you would forget. Mm -hmm. you know, as soon as that happens, the voice pulls you back out of it again and says, "Remember, I'm manipulating you," right? <laughs> right. Uh, this question is for Nora from Walkabout. <coughs> You've clearly had a vision that has long predated this moment, but now how do you see the role of science fiction and fantasy in helping us work towards ambiguous utopias like Le Guin? Uh, well, I mean, there's, there's multi parts to this, to this uh, thing here. One of which is that I'm not sure Le Guin considered, um, I'm pretty sure she did not consider Omelas to be a utopia. I mean, I pretty, I'm pretty sure that she was not particularly trying to steer us towards a utopia. Um, she was, um, if you read her essays, um, I actually enjoy Le Guin's essays and letters more than um, her blog back in the days when she discovered <laughs> Web 2.0. She just went hardcore on the entire internet and it was a thing of glory. Um, and so, you know, she was pretty clear about the fact that she was kind of speaking back towards, um, in a lot of cases, what science fiction kept depicting as utopias, which were sort of horrifying places when you really thought about them if you weren't like a cishet white dude from middle America, yada, yada, yada. Um, she was speaking against that. Um, so the, you, you do have to kind of understand the context in which she's working. Um, but I mean, in my own case, I, it's not that I'm being particularly, um, you know, pre, pre-scient, prescient, I don't know how to say that word. I, um, I'm not, it's not that I'm trying to be particularly prescient about the current moment. It's that the current moment has happened before over and over and over again, and it will continue to happen over and over again until we change our society. Um, and right now the little cosmetic improvements that people are suggesting are not enough. So this will happen again. Um, and it's not really super prescient to realize that if you, um, what is the, the statement? Uh, stupidity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Yeah. So, yeah. So, we, yeah so we live in stupidopia instead of yeah. utopia. Idiocracy. <laughs> yeah, the idiocracy. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Okay. Um, <coughs> Kenny, oh, okay. let me. I have a question for you. Uh, do you write novels? Would you feel like writing a novel? Or I have know? never written a novel. Uh, I have written um, the the first part of a novel. Um, <coughs> I, I think the scale scares me a little bit, mm -hmm. and um, the notion of maintaining not only the reader's interest but my interest over. 40 or 100,000 words, um, I'm skeptical um, of, uh, and I don't, you know, much as I adore reading novels, I don't think I fully understand them yet. You mm -hmm. know, I, I, I understand short stories at kind of a, you know, in here level, um, but novels, I have, I, I, I work with a lot of other writers who are friends 
and they've asked me to critique novels as well as to critique short stories. And whenever I critique a novel, I always put this little asterisk with a caveat at the beginning saying, so here's what I have to say about it, but I don't really understand novels. So it might be that it might be that everything I'm saying is like totally wrong because I'm not sure I get novel as a, as, as a concept, much as I enjoy reading them. Uh, I'd like to write a novel someday, for one thing, because more people read novels. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be nice to be read by more people. Um, uh, we have a question here from Linda Addison. Oh, Linda. For, for Hello, Linda. Uh, do you suspect that uh, the virus isolation and rise of protests against racism and an idea of digging out systemic racism might come out in your or other future writing? Others future writing. Inevitable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's coming out now as I'm writing book two in the Cities trilogy. And well, first off, I keep having to change my damn outline because 2020 is, is, is you know, basically jossing everything that I already planned. Um, but that said, yeah, it's, it, I always do that in my fiction. It's good to see you again, Linda. I think yeah. the last time I saw you was at a KGB reader. Sure. Uh, I, this is added at me, but um, let's let's start with you guys first. I don't know if they were asking me the question or just because I'm the MC here. Uh, do you believe the year 2020 could be written as a dystopian novel? If it had been written years before, would it have been taken seriously? <laughs> of course. Well, Sarah, well, Sarah, Sarah already did that. Sarah? Sarah, Sarah Pinsley, Pinsley, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. She already wrote the. I mean, she, she's tired of hearing me say it, but 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 um, but yeah, uh, the um, song for a new day is is basically this year. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. I have At least from my experience, I can tell you that I have written things that were um, almost word for word exactly what some people have said and interactions I've had, and then in in a writers group, they're like, "Well, this is ridiculous. No one would ever say that," you know. Um, and I, I think we're living in an absurd time. So I, yeah, yeah, probably no one would believe it. No one would take it well, seriously. I mean, I mean, it looks like people in the chat have mentioned this, but yeah, Octavia Butler did do uh, Parable yeah. of the Sower and Talents, in which, uh, among other things, a a bumbling demagogue rises to the presidency by riding on the religious right with a slogan of make America great again. And he immediately turns the, the already dystopian society into a much, much, much worse place. Hmm. So, and I remember when I read that book back in like the nineties, um, the first time I read it, I was like, you know, wow, I really hope, you know, th this, this seems implausible. I hope that, you know, she's not drawing on anything realistic here. And <laughs> yep, she was. So, um, yeah. Hmm. Oh, wait, not this one. This one. Uh, Joseph Kennedy asks, what have you discovered since we've been isolated? A new creator, a new way of connecting, a new website, or a new humor, or a new humor, something inspiring. <clears throat> Ken, you want to take that one? Okay, so I mean, um, it's hard for me because I've spent most up until most of the of the lockdown, I've spent uh, locked in front of a screen, trying to teach online, and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I've had some nice discoveries in that. Mostly, it was just really, 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 really hard work. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, no, I mean, I mean, I, I think everything I could say has already been said by other people. You know, the quiet is nice. Um, spending time with people I love at home is nice. Um, uh, but there's so much that's not nice that's going on mm -hmm. at the same moment. And there's, there's, uh, it's stupid to say that this highlights inequality in a new way because like we like like we needed yet one more way for inequality to be highlighted. Um, but it does. Um, I'm kind of in awe of of the protests, you know, in a sense of I mean, I mean, I, I'm a sucker. I feel I think I feel this way every single time, right? Oh, now this time it's gonna change. 
mm-hmm. right? This time, th- th- this time, people are going to listen. This time, this time, it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to do something, and I can't help myself. You know, I feel that way this time too. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, we move, we move a little. Um, um, but of course, we've been disappointed so many times, right? Mm-hmm. Over and over again um, by this. The change doesn't come. I, I think that hope is is natural and normal, um, and I, I have that hope too, you know, and I am cynical as shit at this point. Um, you know, I've been at some of the protests, though, and the energy is like, it's like what other people probably get out of church. I'm, I'm agnostic, but, uh, you know, it's it's like you suck in that hope yeah. and that determination, and, and you put some of yours back out into it, too, and... You know, I've been going to protest my whole life, um, and there is something different here. I don't know what. Maybe it's just the fact that the cops um, are are uh, being more, what is the word, equal opportunity in their utter violence. Um, I hate to say it, but that has more impact in some ways than I think we, I think we will yet see what that's going to do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the fact that I'm hearing certain quarters mentioning things like defund police, abolish police that would never have mentioned that before. I mean, that gives me some hope. Um, mm-hmm. the, the Overton window has been shifted a little bit, even just a little bit. Um, that said, um, the thing that I am discovering, which I guess is giving me the, the biggest heartening thing is... Um, I have always believed that New York um, was kind of unique in some ways in its willingness to, in in its citizens' kind of willingness to help each other. And I had begun to believe that a lot of that was gone. Um, You know, we've all, any of us that have been here long enough have been raised with the stories of people jumping out into the middle of the street to direct traffic during blackouts um, or, you know, doing what they need to do to take care of each other. But, I mean, I have seen... Um, I there was a cynical part of me that didn't think that that was going to be the case. But as the rest of the country, or as large chunks of the country are trying to like have protests over getting their nails done and stupid shit like that, um, I'm seeing at the protests, I'm seeing almost everyone wearing a mask. They've got uh, hand sanitizer taped to the light poles um, so that people can can try. I mean, there's no way to socially distance it given the size of these things. But I've been seeing people trying to care for their fellow citizens. And that's something that I had almost sort of lost belief in. I'd, I'd been writing about it almost as a myth um, in hope, but seeing the reality is helping. So. Uh, I think this could be a addressed uh, a follow-up, a perfect follow-up to that. What has given you consistent joy during these past months? Hmm. Ken, you want to <laughs> try that one? <laughs> uh, good fiction, actually. Um, hmm. And the family. Hmm. I'm finding the ability to see people online and video chat with people who I never chatted before. Yeah. And all over the world. I mean, huh. it's exhausting, but I'm still finding it. It's I hate being on the phone. <laughs> you know, chats, I mean, I, I actually kind of get bored on a telephone call, but seeing people and talking to them is so different, and I'm really, in, I'm mostly enjoying it. Hmm. Yeah, me too, actually. <laughs> I mean, I've been chatting with some of my writers who slash friends and just all kinds of people and staying in touch. and. And my mom, I mean, I'm FaceTiming, not FaceTime, Facebook Messenger with my mom every day. And um, and it's much less of a chore than being on the phone with her. You know? yeah. <laughs> so I don't care. Much. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, but on being in person, it's it's actually great. Hmm. She's in Florida, so I don't know when I'm going to ever see her again. Hmm. It's it's making me really appreciate, like, this. I the... a week, in two weeks. Oh. Uh. I think it's making me really appreciate like the the, the small things. So um, Teresa Delucci and Prit Paul Baines, they live in our building. And so we recently, uh, for my birthday last week, we went up to the roof and we had chairs and we sat apart and the wind was blowing and we, we had a drink and we sat up there and watched the sunset. And it was like, we've seen them two or three times since, since the quarantine. And it was just really, really nice just to be able to sit with friends and have a drink because it's something that like, it used to be just so ordinary, and now it seems mm-hmm. exceptional. And 
mm-hmm. take it for granted. And I can't, I haven't done, I've met friends, I've met a couple of friends outside and just talked. Mm-hmm. Um, so a couple of friends of mine want to go and have dinner outside in a restaurant in Hoboken. And I said, I, first of all, I can't get there. I'm not taking the path. Yeah. And I'm going to get in a car with you. Mm-hmm. And you can't be far enough away from each other in the table with your masks up. Yeah. And I'd go on mm-hmm. a picnic. If we could do a picnic somehow, I'd consider that. And mm-hmm. I really like to see people in person, you know? Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I can't, I, I can't, I'm afraid to go to the protest because I'm old <laughs> and of asthma, you know, slight asthma. And it's like, um, I really am so. I'm so glad about the protests. I mean, I'm really glad that they're persisting, that they're keep on going on and on. And I, <clears throat> and I think I'm hope I hope too that it actually makes some change, that it does something long lasting and revolutionary. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, any I more think, questions? Oh, go ahead, Nora. Oh no, I was just going to quickly say I think the thing that is uh, helping me is seeing the creativity that's coming out of this already. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm seeing, like, I'm struggling to write right now. I'm not even playing. Um, normally my output, my daily output is like 1500 to 2000 words and I'm struggling to scrape out 500. Um, and I feel like that's a great day. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm seeing artists come out with their art as protest, um, you know, they're painting a giant Black Lives Matter sign down the middle of Fulton Street in Bed-Stuy. Um, and like the whole community is out like watching and making people direct traffic away because, you know, angry drivers really want to drive on Fulton because <laughs> it's Fulton um, and so on. But, you know, I'm seeing graffiti art again for the first time all over the place. And the graffiti is like really wild, beautiful, powerful art um, that had almost kind of died in New York as a thing, um, but it still exists, you know, yeah. five, five points did not die in vain. So um, these kinds of things help. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Skirwa. We as a country gave ourselves a pat on the back after the civil rights movement, but the work wasn't done. Even if we make strides like defunding the police this time, how do we keep momentum? Get more, get more I mean, color into the politics. Just keep up until Nora go. I mean, I mean, I I think we have to, you know, the 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 system from the top down is is has not worked, is not working, is designed to maintain the status quo. What we're going to have to do is maintain that pressure from the grassroots up, um, because, and it needs to be real grass and not astroturf. Um, but you know, I think that is the only thing that is going to work at this point. I think everything's been too rigged from the top down to to fix anything, and there's no incentive from the top down. Right. That's just me. The, the, yeah, I think. But we're not talking about the reading here. So anyway. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Ken? I'm just saying we're moving way beyond the area of our expertise. I wish I wish I were a political scientist or a historian or or, or someone who understood social dynamics um, better than You're I do. You're an artist. But my, well, my, my understanding, though, of history, though, is that nothing changes except in moments of the most severe crisis is that textbook change theory though. (laughs) So uh, an artist picks that up instinctively. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, over and over and over again. And is this a crisis big enough and it seems awful to put it that way, right? Because there's a sense in which the whole continuity of the society is a crisis. But that's not what I mean, right? By crisis, I mean a change that people who wouldn't otherwise notice it now notice it. Uh, people who have some power to do something um, uh, notice it. I I don't want to. I, I don't want to despair. I'm just, you know, like you. I've been burned too many times. Well, one thing I I think that this uh, pandemic and quarantine has given some of us, not all of us, because not everyone is quarantining, is time to reflect and really really look at the situation. Um, You know, I I mentioned this uh, on my social media feeds, but at the beginning of the quarantine, 
uh, I felt that my anxiety was familiar. And I was like, why is this so familiar? And then I realized, oh, it's the same as my anxiety for climate change. And I realized that, um, you know, we are, it was basically, we were heading into a disaster and not doing anything mm. with the pandemic. And then, you know, I feel like maybe New York did more than, than the rest of the country, um, but we're not doing enough for climate change. And I, and I think like, as far as the Black Lives Matter movement, it's like, I'm hoping that people are looking ha with the time to reflect and see and see what they really value, understanding that there is a real systemic racism problem in this country. It's built into an, like all of our social structures and we need to dismantle that. So I'm hoping that this like pause will give us a breath and maybe, maybe hopefully shift things around, restructure things to make it better for everyone. You know, um, that is my hope. Uh, I think we need, we, we need a lot of work and I, and I don't think it's going to be something that's going to happen overnight, unfortunately. That, yeah. Hmm. Any more questions, guys? In the audience? Hello. <clears throat> Uh, I don't see any questions. Do you guys have anything that you want to ask each other or, or us? I was hoping to be able to show you Magpie, but he didn't move into a good oh, position where exactly I could grab right here. He already bit me once, so I'm not Oh, no! Gonna, I mean, just a little bit, you know. Oh. Now he's flying peacefully next to me. I was going to show you his tail. I told you oh my gosh. his tail at one point. But. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, Magpie is a 17-pound cat, so if he's not in exactly the right position, I cannot pick him up. Wow. So, um, wow. so, yeah, so we're we're working on that. Yeah. Um, Jack's heavier than that. I'm not sure. I haven't weighed him for a while, but he was overweight last year. Jack is not 17 pounds. I've seen Jack. Jack is a big cat, but I don't think he's 17 pounds. I think mm -hmm. I actually weighed him a while ago. I can't remember what mm -hmm. he was. It was bigger. He was heavier than he was before. Yeah. I love Jack. Jack's a great cat. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Perse Persephone was in here for, for for a few minutes, but then she but then she uh, she just walked out. She does not not um, as social a cat. Uh, oh no. As, um, her sister's a bit more social. Her sister Cassiopeia is a bit more social. We need to do a KGB that's nothing but uh, but authors' cats. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Them off. Pick yes. Them Hold up the cat. cat. That's yeah. it. That's the end of that. Here's my monster cat. <laughs> Um, well, I don't see any more questions coming in, so I think that might be a good place to, to end yeah. it. Um, so I just want to say on behalf of Ellen and myself that uh, I thought both of the readings were great. You guys are really yes, fantastic. Um, great and you stories. And it worked really well together. <laughs> yes, we did. Yeah, usually it does. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we really appreciate it. So uh, thank you, guys. She is not cooperating. Very cool. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for, for inviting. For oh, inviting. It was uh it was an honor and uh a pleasure. <laughs> and oh, oh, there. Cat. Yeah. Oh, he's so cute. Oh, he's gigantic. Oh my god, he's so heavy. I gotta put him oh, in. So oh, we got one more question. Let's let's do one more question because we it, it came in at the last oh. second. Walkabout asks, how does SFF help us think our way to a better future by exploring what society looks like if X or Y happens? That's a good question. Hmm. I mean, I've always believed that if you can't imagine something, then you can't make it be. Um, and that is why I, I tried so hard to imagine the society of Umhalat. That was why it frustrated me so much that I could not imagine a world without any kind of bigotry. Um, because if I couldn't imagine it, then I didn't feel capable of working toward it. Um, and I feel like that is what science fiction writers do best. We, you know, we may not necessarily be activists um, or whatever, but in, in our own ways, we are we are giving the zeitgeist room to flex and change. Um, and, and I think that's kind of where we're supposed to imagine a different world. Um, and, and that can be a good thing or a bad thing. We should, we should use the power of that. Um, and hopefully it will help. I think that's entirely right. Covered in cat hair. 
Yeah, <laughs> I think I think that's that that's totally right. I think that we, um, I mean, obviously, we don't always envision the better world, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I think, I mean, Le Guin herself said it. You know, the job of the science fiction writer is to is to, is to do the what if, and then to take it to the next step, the next step, the next step, and to and and to make it real, and to say this plausibly is what it might be. And of course, none of us are prophets, and and, and when we've claimed to predict the future, it's always been a laughable failure. Um, but except for Sarah, not always. Uh, but but um, I be a butler. Yes, an act idea butler. Yes, mm -hmm. um, but. Um, Yes, if you can't imagine it, you can't do it, you can't make it. But also the cautionary tales, right? The if you so you know when when Aldous Huxley wrote Brave New World, his, his main initial motivation was that he was just pissed off at H.G. Wells, and um, he he didn't believe he didn't believe a lot of the assumptions behind a lot of Wells' utopian fiction, and so. And so Brave New World was basically saying, well, here's the only way I could ever see that working. Hmm. You basically brainwash drug everybody to oblivion. Right. Brainwash and drug people into a position where they can't help tell the difference between what the world you've got and what would be good. <clears throat> um, and yet it became this, this icon, this cautionary tale, this warning of where we might be where we might be headed. And I don't think often, I don't think we start with the, the goal of predicting or the goal of warning. We just start with the idea and we say, well, this is, let's play with this and see what happens. Mm -hmm. But sometimes what comes out, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. is, is a warning. With so much of this world dedicated to not imagining anything but this, the, the status quo, mm -hmm just the act of imagining something different can be radical. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, part of the problem is that a lot of science fiction doesn't really get that far in imagining anything different. Um, and what they imagine different is, you know, usually like the technology and not the people. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it, it's, we're the ones who are supposed to fight the status quo in that sense, so. Yeah. Uh, do we have time for one more question? And then I'll, this will be the last question. Does that work? That works for, for me. Sure. Sure. Not to be uh, like a 22 part question. With yes. In, in 73 parts. Uh, once you're done, uh, Jackie Peretz asks, once you're done writing a story like Umhalat and others involving a what if, do you find joy in your work or feel the frustration or both many emotions? Uh, yes, <laughs> many emotions, uh, joy that it's done. Why baby, what do you want? I don't know if you guys can hear him or not, I'm sorry. Um, he wants attention, I have been here too long and he is, he is unhappy with that. Um, but um, you know, joy that it's done, anxiety that I can't make it good because usually the first draft I hate. Um, you know, concern that I, in the case of the the uh, the ones who stay and fight, the concern that I have overstepped myself by trying to fictionally speak back to the great Ursula Le Guin. Um, lots of things. So. Ken. Um, what happens to me sometimes is that I is especially the, the stories that get written in the in fast um, is that I'll I'll look at it and I'll say who who the hell wrote this you know what 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 strange part of my of my brain did this did this come from and do I even, even want to know this person you know sometimes and sometimes sometimes I feel like I've said something important to myself I can't ever know whether I've said anything important to anybody else unless they tell me um, but sometimes I finish the story and I think, okay, I actually do understand something better than I did before. There's actually something I, 
I get. All right. Well, I think on that note, we should probably end the uh, live stream. So um, I just want to uh, thank uh, N.K. Jemison and Ken Schneier for being uh, awesome guests. Uh, thank, of course, Ellen Vatlow, my co-host, for, for being an awesome co-host and uh, all the other awesome things she does. Um, and for you guys uh, listening and watching now and watching the archive later, uh, thank you. Thank you for, su for supporting KGB. Uh, the fantastic fiction. Thank you. Matt, for Matt wait. Well, the archive's on the on the. Um, is there a link from the KGB website to the archive? Yeah. So if you click on the, uh, if you go to the KGB website and then click on the link that says "Watch it here" or "Watch it now," that's actually just the YouTube link. So uh, tomorrow, next week, next year, that YouTube video will be will be up there. <laughs> so <laughs> anyone can watch it at any time. Uh, so if you can't watch it live, thanks so, everyone. Well, yes. Thank you for hosting, guys. It was a great it's pleasure. Great. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much. And okay. uh, we yeah, will... want to stay on for a minute to talk. Why yeah, we're, I'm going to end the live stream, but we'll stay on for okay. uh, for a minute to uh, sign off with everybody. But uh, okay. thank you all, and uh, we will see you guys next month. Have a good night. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. 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 And there they go.